let me just say first of all, my background is in journalism rather than academia. Um, so I'm going to focus more on sort of contemporary affairs, uh, India, Pakistan. I'm going to leave Dow to talk more about the terrorism aspect and I'll look more generally on the conflict. Um, but by way of introduction, you've, you've heard the, the very detailed history here. I've been more recently reading up a lot on Kashmir history, pre-47 history. Um, and one of the things that is striking, and that came out a little bit in, in, in the last talk, is everything that is said, even pre-47 about Kashmir, is about the beauty of the landscape, what a paradise it is. It's very rarely about the people who live there. So Kashmir has always been valued for the territory and not for its inhabitants. Um, and to try and illustrate that, I'm, I'm slightly cheating here. I know you're all students, so let me say this quote I took from a book. But unfortunately, I don't have the original source. But I'm going to use it because it seems to illustrate to me something that we've seen uh, both before and after 1947 when it comes to Kashmir. And that's from um, uh, the Mughal Emperor Akbar's court historian. Um, as you know, the Mughals took over Kashmir in, in uh, uh, 1586. They considered it paradise on earth. But his court historian allegedly said that, quotes, the bane of this country is its people. And I think you should remember that when you think about the conflict now, because you very, very rarely hear the voices of the people in the region. Um, you tend far more to hear the sort of the louder ones from India and Pakistan. Um, I want to add one more thing as a clarification. When I talk about Jammu and Kashmir, we, call, we say Kashmir for short. What I'm actually going to be talking about is the entirety of the former princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, um, as set up in, in, in um, 1846. So that comprises the Kashmir Valley, which is the one that gets all the attention, um, but also uh, Ladakh, uh, Gilgit Baltistan, uh, Jammu, and the part that uh, Pakistan administered Kashmir. And what I, I will go on to discuss the um, sort of progress and failure in peace talks between India and Pakistan. But I thought it would be useful to just tease out some categories in terms of drivers of the conflict so that when you're trying to think about how it might be improved or eased or resolved, then these are all overlapping categories that would need to be addressed. Um, so, I think the first one, and that again came out in the last, in the, in the previous presentation, one of the most important elements in this conflict is ideological. Uh, because Pakistan has always set itself up as a homeland for Indian Muslims, the land of the pure, uh, you've seen right from the beginning an asymmetry between the India and the Pakistan views of Kashmir. Because Pakistan claims it is obvious that Kashmir being Muslim majority should have belonged to Pakistan in, in 1947. India, at least until relatively recently, made its claim on the basis of obviously the instrument of accession, but it also drew its legitimacy from India being secular and, and refused to acknowledge that uh, the decision over Kashmir should be done on the basis of religion. But of the two countries, and again, I would say that's until recently, by far the most ideological has been Pakistan. And I think that, that has actually colored everything in the sense that Pakistan is, is, is incapable of standing out of itself and, and being pragmatic on this, on this, this conflict. Uh, and in its desperation to try and claim Kashmir or regain Kashmir, it has actually nearly destroyed itself in the process. Um, I mean, for a start, it's become a highly militarized state, uh, dominated by the army. Uh, democracy has never really been able to take root. It, um, when the um, 
uh, separatist revolt erupted in Kashmir, in the Kashmir Valley in the late 80s. Uh, Pakistan trade supported and pumped, pumped in Islamist, Islamist militants into the valley to try and press its case. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read about the, um, the, the, the insurgency in the Kashmir Valley through the 90s and early 2000s. It was truly appalling for the people. Uh, yes, there were definitely Indian human rights abuses. Nobody would deny that. But there were also, and what people tend not to tell you so much, is there were terrible abuses by militants coming in from outside. I mean, one thing that didn't tend to get said until very recently, the, the, the militants sent in from Pakistan were raping local women too. It wasn't just the Indian human rights abuses that you hear of. Um, and just, I want to emphasize this point because that Pakistan-backed insurgency was absolutely not in the interest of the people of the valley. They bore the brunt of the violence, but it did them no good. In fact, it made their lives misery. Um, I am um, coming back to Pakistan, though, is that uh, I, I think it's also important to remember, and I've traced this in my, my pre last but one book, the extent to which Pakistan has really damaged itself in this, in this thing. There was a time, because Pakistan had a more open, more flexible uh, economy, that it was actually on a per capita basis richer than India. Um, I mean, I had Indian Muslim friends who would go and visit Pakistan and be so excited by what they could find in the shops. When I first went to Pakistan in the early 2000s, it was still richer than India. Um, and that has been over the years changing. Um, as you've already heard, I mean, Bangladesh is, is, is richer per capita uh, than Pakistan. But India is also now, um, in 2009, um, the trajectory is crossed and Indian uh, GDP per capita became higher than that of Pakistan for the first time. And India has only been getting richer since then, um, whereas Pakistan continues to deteriorate. And I think, you know, it's so important to grasp that only with a, 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 a sort of almost a sort of a, 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 a being imprisoned by this ideological fixation on being this uh, land of the pure, the savior of, of, of Muslims, um, does, until Pakistan actually shakes that off or interrogates it, I see the, the, the situation and the problems continuing. Um, I mean, I also just, I mean, I, I, most of you have probably at least read a little bit about those terrible floods there were in Pakistan. Uh, and uh, thousands of people still living in tents. Um, and I still see people in Pakistan going on about uh, whatever happens in Kashmir. And, you know, and I just feel like looking at them, I, I, it's, it's like, you know, look down the road. Your own people have been drowning in floods. They're living in tents. Before you start trying to get Kashmir back, sort yourself out. And, and I think any of us who've been co covering Pakistan for a long time, I mean, I'm saying this not as an academic, but more as a sort of human being, you do get increasingly frustrated with Pakistan's refusal to change. Um, so yeah, first driver of conflict, ideological. Uh, second one, um, which is which is why I stress that I'm talking about the entirety of the former princely state. The second one is strategic. Um, the valley is very much the emotional heart. It's where the, the, high, you know, the largest population of, 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 of Jammu and Kashmir. But by far the most strategically important and the largest parts of territory are actually further to the north and to the east. So you have Ladakh on the Indian side and you have Gilgit Baltistan on the Pakistan side. Uh, Gilgit Baltistan is now tremendously, always has been, but even more so now, strategically important to Pakistan because that forms its land bridge with China. The, uh, the Karakoram Highway runs through Gilgit Baltistan. 
the China-Pakistan economic corridor that is meant to link uh, China with uh, the Arabian Sea goes through Gilgit-Baltistan. So you have to kind of, in as much as if there is a settlement, it will also have to acknowledge that tremendous strategic importance of Gilgit-Baltistan to Pakistan. Equally, on the Indian side, uh, then um, Ladakh, which uh, has a contested border with China, um, is tremendously important to India as a bulwark against any further encroachment by China on its borders. Uh, that brings me to the third. So we have already got ideological and strategic. The third one, the third category, is, is geopolitical. Um, because so many geopolitical and, and, and local and national conflicts overlap um, in and around Jammu and Kashmir. Um, I mean, the one that often gets overlooked, but don't forget, are Chinese concerns about its periphery. So both Tibet and Xinjiang have, have contested frontiers with Jammu and Kashmir. Um, on the Indian side, uh, India's view has been heavily influenced and scarred by a border war with China in 1962, in which India was, was humiliatingly defeated. Uh, on top of that, sort of all these Chinese connections, you've got then you've got the Afghanistan, um, and as you, most of you, I, I assume, know that after the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan in 1979, Pakistan, funded by America and Saudi Arabia, trained uh, jihadists to fight against the Soviet occupation in, uh, in Afghanistan. That some of those jihadists were later funneled into the Kashmir Valley. Um, some of them have turned their guns on Pakistan itself. And I think Dawood will talk more about that. Uh, and finally, in terms of the, that geopolitical category, don't forget we now also have growing tensions between India and China, which make the whole thing even more volatile and complex. <clears throat> a fourth category I would add, it slightly overlaps with strategic, but I would include territorial, um, partly because it's the subject of my last book as I've been writing about the frontiers, the contested frontiers of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, I think it is a bit of a separate category because what you see are localized fights over uh, the various frontiers, whether there's the line of control between, uh, which divides Jammu and Kashmir between India and Pakistan, and the line of actual control between India and China. Uh, what you sometimes see is, 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 is localized flare-ups, because these are not, uh, are not um, agreed borders. These localized flare-ups in turn have the potential for much wider escalation and then feeding off the other bigger causes of tension. So you have it working both ways. You have the kind of big tensions between capitals coming in the way and creating trouble on the border, but you also have the border flare-ups themselves creating conflict. Um, I think we saw that in the, in the Cargill War, for example, in, in uh, uh, in 1999, sort of, sort of started as a bit of a sort of territorial fight, but very quickly kind of escalated and, and could have got far worse. It didn't, but could have done. Uh, some of you might also have seen a couple of years ago the worst fighting between uh, Indian, Indian Chinese troops um, since 1962. Um, Again, not entirely clear yet what happened there, but it looks more like a little bit of kind of local tensions being allowed to escalate out of control. Obviously, I, I don't know how many of you have seen that, that, that those kind of mountains and that land. This, this is vast, vast, uninhabited, huge mountains. Uh, you don't have, you know, signposts or people around or anything to know exactly where the border is. They, both sides have their maps, but maps are contested. So in that kind of, uh, I mean, I know I'm in the Netherlands, I'm not, I'm trying to think of mountains that it's comparable to, but I mean, it's, it, this, is, this is way bigger than the, 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 the French Alps, for example. So, uh, you know, something where 
a lot of kind of things go on at a local level that you can never be 100% sure what happens because you can't get there and there's no one there to witness it. So, and I just like, I'll come to the peace process, but I'd like to just in my categories of, of ideological, um, strategic, geopolitical, and territorial, I would just like to mention very briefly um, the sort of history and historiography is the extent to which nobody or neither side can agree the historical background. Um, and I mean, because I love history, then I kind of have a slightly idealized view that if only everyone would actually try and reconcile their competing views of history, then maybe they would find a way of, of, of um, understanding each other a bit better. But I suspect that's the kind of utopian nonsense that those of us who like history say, and that really, even if you did settle the history, they would still have plenty of reasons to, uh, reasons to argue. Uh, so, um, I, I'm trying to, I'm thinking I was going to try and say something positive about the way forward. I'm not sure I can, but what I will do is, um, is talk about uh, the peace initiatives between India and Pakistan, uh, of which there have been many over the years, and uh, all of which have foundered. Uh, but the one, and one of the ones I did the most research into, and the one that was, was nearly successful, was uh, where we're kind of behind the scenes diplomatic talks between envoys of then Pakistan President Pervis Musharraf and Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. Um, started under Manmohan Singh's predecessor in around 2002, and then basically sort of got, began to run out of, of momentum around 2006, 2007. But these were, to my mind, the most promising, or they came up with the most promising formula for peace over Jammu and Kashmir. Um, the, the, the basic uh, our agreement, which was included in a, in a, I think about six to eight page non-paper, uh, agreed that there would be no exchange of territory. So Jammu and Kashmir would be continued to be divided um, as it is now in the line of control between India and Pakistan. Uh, so effectively, the line of control would be become the international border. But they also, their intention was to um, make borders irrelevant and make it easy for people to, to trade and uh, move across it. And, you know, it's again, if you remember what I said at the start, um, Throughout history, there's been very little attention to what the people of this region actually want for themselves. And to my mind, one of the great advantages of this, 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 this draft peace agreement they had is that people from the different parts of Jammu and Kashmir would be able to travel, to meet, to educate together, to trade. They might actually find out that they do all want different things. I suspect that is the case. But until people get that opportunity to communicate freely, then you're never going to know that. And that would have given them, I think, some kind of agency in settling their future. Uh, there were a couple of other things that are also important, is that both sides were to give maximum autonomy to the different parts of Jammu and Kashmir they control. So uh, that didn't just apply to the Kashmir Valley, but Gilgit Baltistan, all the other parts as well. And then finally, and this was a little bit of a fig leaf for Pakistan, there was to be a joint mechanism um, in which representatives from India, Pakistan, and Jammu and Kashmir would be able to meet to discuss areas of common interest. Now, I've spoken to people on both sides um, and you hear, for those who were invested in the peace process, you hear enormous amounts of regret that that failed. Um, nobody can say for sure that it would have worked. Um, it might have foundered anyway, but it was certainly the most promising uh, draft peace agreement around. 
So let's look at why it failed. Uh, a very minor reason, uh, but definitely worth mentioning to be even-handed, is India was a little bit slow and cumbersome in grabbing, in grabbing the peace deal when it was there on offer. Uh, but above all, it, 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 what happened was Musharraf was driven out of, out of power. And I think it's terribly important to note that it could not be sustained, that peace draft peace agreement could not be continued without him. It depended on one man and one man's envoy doing secret talks. There had been no attempt to build the people, um, uh, build popular opinion behind it. And actually the political parties, even the democratic parties that took office after him disowned it. And that should tell you a little bit about the sheer power of ideology is that promising peace talks could not be sustained beyond one man who was invested in them. And that not even the democratic parties who have the most to gain in peace between India and Pakistan were willing to then continue to push it forward. Um, and then what really killed it off is the, um, uh, the Mumbai attacks of 2006-11-2008. Uh, I don't know how many, you, you guys are probably a little bit young to remember the Mumbai attacks, but I really urge you to go and watch some of the old YouTube videos on that. I mean, 166 people were killed. One of the most shocking things, it's somewhat, sorry, I mean, I, this is a, I have to phrase this carefully. I think what people tend to do is only focus on, you know, the big obvious landmarks, the, the Taj Hotel and so on. But actually, if you look at the way that the, those attacks played out, you're also looking at 166 people, large numbers of them killed in the railway station. These are ordinary commuters going about their day-to-day -day life. And, you know, I don't, I think this is partly why it had such a big impact on India. Uh, we paid attention to the, in the West to the foreigners killed. But if you watch, watch some of those old videos of people who lost poor people who lost relatives in the, um, in the railway station. And you, you will and should be horrified. And um, there is no doubt that was backed by Pakistan. The jihadis came from Pakistan. They came by boat from Karachi. It was done with the knowledge of Pakistani intelligence. And yet Pakistan has never properly owned up to it, or even, I think, at a popular level, acknowledge the sheer horror of that attack. After the Mumbai attacks, I, I, I think Manmohan Singh, from, because I was following it very closely at the time, uh, Manmohan Singh did actually even then still try to get that draft peace agreement back up and running again. And, uh, and it just, as I said, it just couldn't really get anywhere. Uh, and. Personally, watching it, my frustration was that there was no buy-in from Pakistan. I mean, one thing we, and you hear, you'll hear Western um, government officials or Western diplomats saying this, is every year that goes by, the offer on the table to Pakistan gets worse. And this was really going to be the best offer Pakistan was going to get on Jammu and Kashmir, and now they've, they've, they've missed their chance. I don't know whatever they'll get next time, but it will be worse. I don't see that particular formula being being revived now, that draft peace agreement. Um, one thing, and I, I'm not sure how many of you followed this because it's a little bit uh, inside track for um, Jammu and Kashmir, but in 2019 the Indian government revoked the autonomy of the, 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 the Kashmir, of, of the Indian side of Jammu and Kashmir, the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, that had, an, uh, again, most of the attention went on the valley there and on some protests which subsequently fizzled out against this revocation of the autonomy. But to my mind, what was actually even more important in that move in 2019 was the, the disaggregation of the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir. So they separated out Ladakh as a separate territory and then left the Kashmir Valley and Jammu 
to be run as a state, a separate, a separate unit. So effectively what the Indian government is saying is there is no, um, there is no longer a state of Jammu and Kashmir. So if there is no state, there is nothing to settle, there is no dispute. Um, I had, until 2019, I had personally always believed that, uh, that the dispute needed to be settled with reference to the entirety of, of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, as constituted from 1846, um, and that it, it needed, even if not on paper, it needed to be considered as, a, as, a, as an ent entirety of an actual place um, that was initially broken up in 47 and 48 by Pakistan and India, and now has been broken up even more by India between uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. Uh, I fear, and I hope somebody might be able to come up with a more positive um, argument, but personally, I, I, what I, I, I fear that what we now have is a fait accompli. That state that existed for 100 years, from 1846 to 1947, no longer exists. It's been pulled apart by India and Pakistan. It's now been pulled further apart by, uh, uh, by India. Pakistan, in any case, had pulled off Gilgit Baltistan from Pakistani Kashmir. It's basically been separated into its constituent parts by India and Pakistan. It no longer exists and can no longer be framed as a dispute to be settled in those terms. So, you know, what I would say, just to try and sum up, is that in, in as much as where we can envisage some kind of solution. It probably will involve accepting the line of control as the international border. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir will no longer exist. Both will be absorbed into India and Pakistan. I think from, you know, going back to my strategic drivers of conflict, to some extent that will suit both Pakistan and India because Pakistan has a strategic interest in having its, its, its ownership of Gilgit Baltistan confirmed. And India has a strategic interest in, 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 in making sure it's never challenged in Ladakh. Uh, you still, that will still end up with the Kashmir Valley, uh, where, uh, as I said, Pakistan's ideological view that the Kashmir Valley, that it must be there to represent the Muslims of the Kashmir Valley, even as it sends jihadis in to kill them, or certainly used to do. That ideological commitment will, will remain and make it hard to find a longer term solution for the valley. Anyway, I'll stop there. I'm always glad to hear of people who've got more positive suggestions, but it seems at the moment we're on a um, we're on a bit of a kind of drift towards simply um, confirming the status quo without the people ever having been involved in what should happen to them. Thank you.